Got it. Gotcha. We're good. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to today's community briefing. My name is Gregory Sneed, and today is, I always have to check to make sure, the 25th of April. And I was astounded yesterday because I was on something and they said the it was this is the last Wednesday of the month. I'm like, wait, wait, where's April? Where did it go? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Mar for some reason, April seemed to go a lot faster than March. I don't know what it was, but um, even February, yeah. even February seemed longer. It was Black History Month and it only had 20, well, it had an extra day, 29 days, but yeah. it just seemed to go really fast. So yeah, here we are on the 25th of April, uh, 2024. Uh, thank you for joining us today's uh, community briefing. And my name is Gregory Sneed. Uh, we have a uh, super fabulous guest. Uh, it's a surprise guest. And we'll be uh, bringing him on momentarily. But in the meantime, um, uh, it's my pleasure to bring to the virtual stage the queen of our community briefing, Miss Crystal Mitchell. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Glad that you are here. Um, this is yeah may april did go by fast i think we're on like supersonic jet get through the end of the year but i wish it would slow down a little bit because it's just way intense <laughs> way intense but welcome to the community briefing this is the platform our platform actually to meet and greet all of our leaders and stakeholders and just people that are doing things in the community that's making our community a better place to to work and live and and raise our families in um, we are sponsored and powered by Recycling Black Dollars and uh, the BBA. And our uh, fiduciary, our financial sponsors, our monetary sponsors is the Los Angeles LDC, uh, Southern California Edison, PCR, Wells Fargo, and SoCal Gas. Um, we want you to know that this is your platform. We have some incredible guests today. One of our very own, he's going to razzle and dazzle you. Uh, we are closing out the month of April with financial literacy slash competency. <laughs> and it's important to understand your money. And Greg, Mr. Gregory J. Sneed is going to explain to you why that is. He's going to even introduce himself. He's going to read his own bio. <laughs> So that's how we started out this month. Uh, this platform has an amazing team. We have obviously Gregory Sneed, myself, Mr. Stephen Turner, who is the producer and brings all the wonderful guests that we have here to this platform, and Ms. Robin Billups. She hadn't checked in yet. Yesterday, we had an incredible day at the ULI um, Marketplace. We met some great people. I'm exhausted, so I imagine Robin might be a bit exhausted, but or she's at another event herself. But it was awesome; it was incredible. So, with that, I am going to kick it back over. Stephen, you coming in at the end? Okay. We want to welcome our regulars, Miss Renee Talbert and Joseph Duncan and Roz Pendleton, and I think actually Terrence has been here a couple of times. So, everyone, this is your platform. Please introduce yourself in the chat. And we're going to move it on back and kick it back to Gregory Sneed. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So we actually did have a guest for today, and a guest needed to reschedule. So yours truly was voluntold to um, uh, show up and do some uh, financial literacy. Uh, so, uh, and this is Financial Literacy Month. Um, and and I, I, there have been some things about calling it financial capability because it's not only to be literate, to know, but to be capable. You know, you may know that you've got to reconcile your bank account or keep track of your uh, finances, but to be able to know how to do that and, and do that with some level of expertise uh, is there. And um, we've also been trying to push for financial literacy in the schools, you know, to teach this. Far too many times, um, Adults, um, you know, we, we come out of school, we know all these different uh, programs to get a degree, advanced degree. We don't know the basic things of just managing your checking account or just, you know, basic financial stuff. So we're going to go over just some basics today. Um, we'll, we'll get into a couple of areas and then uh, we'll also take uh, questions um, to help you 
because I, I I run into a lot of people who are just they're, they're great at maybe their business, but they're terrible at finances. Um, yeah, I've often run into in um, my coaching practice where folks have razor focused and laser focused, razor sharp and laser focused on their business finances, but have a not a clue as what's going on from a personal standpoint, or they're commingled, so they're commingled together. And uh, Crystal teaches that in her accounting classes. Obviously, you want to keep that um, separated. Uh, we were talking before we went live that um, I've been using um, uh, Quicken, the Quicken program, and the Quicken Home and Business. And what was happening with Quicken Home and Business is it was getting, I guess, AI, it was getting intuitive, and it was getting too smart for its own good, in, in, so to speak. <laughs> it was making things happen. When I, it's like, wait, well, I don't want to do that. So uh, essentially, I guess two years ago, I uh, extracted the business from the Quicken. I even just uh, had to start all over again, actually, and started a new Quicken um, uh, account and then went with a different program and software for the business. Um, and now with uh, the banks, you can select and deselect which accounts, even because my business and personal are with the same uh, with the same bank. Uh, so the systems are set up now to really to, to allow to do that. And, and um, it, it was just a good thing to do. So uh, I've got I'm going to uh, kind of uh, blow through a presentation that I do, which is just the basics of financial literacy. We'll go through that pretty quickly. We'll go through some uh, questions um, and uh, and take it from there. So let's see if I can launch this effectively through the screen share and let me know if you're seeing that correctly. And you guys seeing that? Yes. All right. So. Yes. All right. Let's make it this. This works. Come on. Is that working? There we go. So about me. So I've got over 40 years of experience in the financial industry. Uh, worked in large corporations, pretty much the entertainment industry. Uh, then small business. Uh, I have been out of corporate since uh, 2003. So last 21 years as a uh, uh, as an entrepreneur, um, it gives a lot of flexibility, but I do miss getting a steady regular paycheck. That's for sure. Um, I've existed with hundreds of clients, um, actually probably getting close to over a thousand now in financial advice, wealth building, and uh, finan finding financial peace of mind. Um, graduated at Delphi University. I've got a bachelor of business administration degree in accounting and uh, I'm a member of Alpha Phi Alpha, and I like jazz. And all right, so uh, anybody know who this guy is? You, <laughs> you. <laughs> so it's it's interesting because I've been do I do this uh, um, uh, what have you. This was the um, this is the nickname my parents gave to me when I was when I was a, a young boy. And they called me Jack Benny, and so. My parents told me for some reason that I was always good with money and the story and I tell we went out somewhere and uh, I saw something I like and I wanted to get it. And my mom said, well, what happened to your allowance? And I said, well, I left it at home. And so she says, well, I can buy it for you. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah great. And she says, well, but when we get home, you're going to have to reimburse me from your money. And she said, I thought about it for a moment, kind of like what he's doing there. And I said, yeah, that's OK. So. Even at a young age, I had buying discretion of not overspending. And for years, I thought that was a talent that I had uh, developed, but I realized that it was a gift. It was a gift that was given to me and not just to keep for myself, but to share with others. So I enjoy what I do in terms of uh, financial literacy. And we're gonna talk about money today, budgeting, tracking expenses, debit cards, um, give you some tips so if you've got a piece of paper, you want to take some notes, savings accounts, checking accounts. And again, this is my basic program, and we'll skim through this pretty quickly uh, and to uh, just keep it going. So there's only three things you can do with money, all right? And what are those? You can spend it, save it, or pay taxes, all right? Obviously, most of us are probably uh, expert level in spending, okay? <laughs> we, know how, we know how to spend some money. Um, we probably need all need to work on saving money, 
uh, and and saving more money and paying taxes. Uh, I, I know no one really likes to pay taxes, but um, there are strategies out there um, that I'm sure Crystal, I know uh, Joseph is is a business consultant. Uh, there, there are a lot of ways to minimize tax, setting up corporations if you're in business, uh, to uh, set up either a, a uh, certainly either a DBA, an LLC, or an S Corp. You can talk to somebody in terms of the, the differences between them. Uh, there's some advantages of having passed through money coming through a business first. Um, and especially if you have employees, if you're a solopreneur or a, um, a CEO, chief everything officer, then um, you may or may not be paying yourself or paying yourself regularly. So there's a lot of things you can do to um, try to minimize your taxes, unless you just love giving a lot of money to Uncle Sam. And uh, I can tell you that I'm not one of them. So um, is your money funny? Um, uh, that's, uh, that's a little gimmick that I use and but you want to have it but this is the type of money you'd really like to have imagine if you had that at home um not much is there but i'm sure it's a lot but i would love to have obviously that um pretty a little bit of a theft risk but um now this is something that i do as an exercise with my financial literacy class uh, as i give out actually hand out million dollar bill i have my one some here and then i ask what would you do with it right um and i give them this sheet of paper and it's a write down 10 things so if you had a million dollars what would you do with it and i get lots of responses the one thing that i will tell you and i'm going to give away my one of my uh, secrets on the one thing that rarely comes back is that um everyone assumes that it's tax-free i would say out of you know 50 people that I gave this to, there might be one that might put taxes. But essentially, you just assume you get a million dollars. You didn't, did you ask the question, you know, do I have to pay taxes on it? Do I set some money aside for taxes? Uh, what happens with a lot of our entertainers or athletes? They get these uh, signing bonuses. Um, uh, uh, Shaquille O'Neal, listen to, he has a, a video that he recorded on his first year in the NBA. And I think he got $20 million or it was some some crazy amount of money. And uh, at the end of the year, it was gone. He said, what do you mean it's gone? Um, and he, a couple of things he didn't realize, A, the, you know, tracking it, but he didn't realize or take into account taxes. And with NBA players, they have to pay, now of course, federal tax, but they have to pay state tax in every state that they play. So every, you know, if he's going to New York to play a game, portion of his salary is earned in New York, he's got to pay New York state taxes, he's got to pay taxes to Oklahoma, Florida, etc. So it's, it's important to stay on top of the taxes. Um, quite often businesses and individuals can get, um, they're not aware of what taxes are and end up in tax trouble. No, that's not something we want to do. Um, so what is that? That's a roadmap. All right. Where is that heading? Well, what I'm going to say here is a budget. A budget is a financial roadmap. It's a guideline. And there's a limit on how much money we have to spend, at least for most of us. I don't know if there's anybody on the call that has unlimited amount of money to spend, but you've got it. Most of us have a limit. You got to control your spending because every day you're making a decision to spend or not spend the amount of ads that we're bombarded with. Um, yes, Bianca, you got a question real quick? Or was that an accidental? Going once, twice. Okay, go. Okay. So- That was uh, just a sneeze, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that is discretion. And so making a decision to spend or not to spend, this is an area where um, many of us can can struggle. I've, I've had some clients that really have a problem with this, and um, it is a, it is a challenge. That discretion of whether you're going to buy something or not. Um, for those of us who are um, uh, frugal, uh, it perhaps a little bit more easy. Um, for others, this is a daily challenge, All right? Uh, should you spend all the money you have? This is what I was just talking about. Discretion is the thought you put into spending and discipline is sticking to that plan. So discretion 
and then discipline. Stick to your budget. Um, nobody likes a budget, right? It's, a budget is like going on a diet. You know, it's it's you, you don't like going on a diet, but a, a budget is a guideline to help you to stay on course and to keep you out of trouble. All right, so this is uh, looking at where all your money went. Tracking expenses, obviously you want to write things down, get a book, notebook, software. I mean, there's so much software and apps uh, out there that are um, available, things on your phone, they're getting very intuitive, there's alerts. The bottom line is you got to know uh, where your money is going. All right, let's talk about, uh, everybody know what that is, right? Card, mm -hmm. ATM card, debit card. So it's interesting. Um, you know, doing some research before on a uh, on another matter and how um, the first thing that came out was ATM cards. So there was an ATM and you can only use it to get cash out of that machine at the bank. And then uh, somewhere I have the years where the debit card came out and it, it was easy money. Right. Um, but it, you have to be careful about using it. It does not have the same protection as a credit card. We're going to get into that in a moment. And obviously, if somebody gets your PIN, they can wipe out. Um, this is one here, never loan your ATM card to anybody. This is a big issue with um, uh, folks um, in their 20s. You know, they, they don't have cash, so someone's going and they're just giving them the ATM. Here, use, you know, use my card. Um, now, here's a big one. Consider having a backup debit card in case a card is lost. I even have a backup checking account. So I have a secondary checking account. It's just sitting dormant. Um, it was free, although now my bank is charging me $4.95 a month to keep it. But it's it, for me, it's worth it. So what happens if your bank account gets hacked or it gets attached or it gets wiped out? All right. Um, how long is it going to take for you to get to the, the bank and open up a new account or uh, get things sorted out? It can be three to five business days. So I recommend having a backup checking account and also a backup debit card. Uh, let's see if this is on here. Yeah, let's go back to that. So let's let's also use what I have is a prepaid card. Um, it's a, a debit card that I use only for um, 7-Eleven parking meters, uh, I'll use that sometimes for online purchases, especially with a merchant that's not like a mainline merchant. I keep $100 on that card and I transfer money over to it. So in the event that that card number gets hacked, the most I'm out is 100 bucks. And if you're gonna get recovered, but I'm gonna have to worry about money getting swiped from a, uh, a, a account and that might be mortgage money. It, it may take the bank three to five days to reimburse you or figure it out. So what do you do in the meantime? If it, ha if it happens on the 30th or the 30 f 31st of the month and now things are due on the 1st and they may not rectify it until the 4th or the 5th, you, you may have some problems. So I use a uh, sort of a backup or, or prepay uh, debit card and um, and I'm very careful with not using my main checking debit card. Uh, I don't have that account number on file with anybody. If I'm using it, I'm only using it for point of sale. I'm at physically there and I am taking advantage of the tap as much as I can and not the um, inserting the card. Why? Because the tap helps uh, first to bypass any attempt that someone has a skimmer or has some kind of device where they are reading the uh, card number. If you're inserting your you're inserting your card, um, it's kind of like uh, I guess I'll go there. It's kind of like unsafe sex, right? You just you know st stick it into the into the machine. Where if you have that backup debit card or if you're using the tap function, I highly recommend using that for your purchases. All right, credit cards, um, great tool, but it can be very dangerous. All right, this is my statement here. A credit card debt is stuff you bought that you could not afford, but you bought it anyway. It allows you to spend more money than you have. Um, some of us are probably at the age where we remember layaway. You guys remember layaway? <laughs> um, you, you, you couldn't take the merchandise until you finished paying for it. They would take it in the back 
Um, and then with the debit card, you can you can only spend to the money that you have in the account. But credit card allows you to build debt up. And now that rates have gone up, credit cards are carrying very hefty interest rates. Um, I know that I don't have a balance on my uh, department store card, but I did notice on the um, I still get a statement that comes in. And I think the rate is like 31 point something, almost 32 percent, which is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty hefty. Um, that's almost usury, I guess. That's what they used to call it. The, okay. Only the loan sharks were getting that kind of rate. Now, all of the credit card companies and most of the banks are. And it's usury. Yeah, exactly. Um, my, so it, Joseph mentioned the thing I, in the old days, people robbed banks. And now today, the banks are robbing people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, let's see. Minimum payments make you an indentured servant to the bank. Um, but credit cards more and more now are being required to pay for airline, hotel, and car rental. Does anybody run into that where you're trying to uh, pay for airline, hotel on a debit card? And I don't think it has the same mechanisms to put a hold on it. Uh, so um, it is uh, it is good to have credit cards specifically for um, for for travel. Um, of course, interest rates can be high, and um, the Credit Card Act of two thousand nine. So what happened there? That required banks to put on the statement a uh, one to show you clearly what the um, uh, rate is. But also, what is the impact of making uh, minimum payments? And if you're making minimum payments, the time period to pay off the balance ranges anywhere from about 27 to 31, 32 years. So if you're making minimum payments, you won't pay that balance off until almost three decades. So that becomes almost like a mortgage or even worse. All right. Uh, let's talk about a promise. Anybody, a uh, uh, definition of a promise is a legally binding declaration. Uh, so why is a, a promise uh, uh, important? Well, we're going to get in and find out right now, all right? So remember these promissory notes? Anybody, anybody you remember? <laughs> you, had, uh, you, you had a, a note, and essentially that promissory note now has turned into five, six, seven pages of a uh, of an agreement, and how many of us have actually gone through that agreement and read everything? Very few of us, right? But it, what I mentioned about that is that a promise is, anybody have, a, anybody have a promise made to you and somebody broke it? Yeah, anybody? Hmm. Um, <laughs> so what happens with a broken promise, right? Well, essentially, when you're borrowing money on credit, you're making a promise to the bank that you're going to pay it on time. And if you don't do that, if you don't keep your promise, there's some repercussions. Uh, those repercussions can end up with your credit score. And then obviously bad repercussions can be if you're not paying your car note, well, guess who shows up to take your car? The repo man. So uh, credit score is uh, FICO. And it is a, uh, basically it's a, um, a measurement or a score of how good are you at keeping your promises? Yeah, are you paying things on time? Uh, are you consistently late? Um, that impacts your credit score. Uh, sometimes if you have no credit at all, this is what they call shallow credit, uh, that can be a problem because a, a, they have no way of judging how good are you at keeping promises. Uh, and, and then employers are looking to see whether you have um, are keeping up with it as well. And then obviously uh, the numbers, anything over 800 plus is excellent. If you're at 725 to 799, good, 675. And um, I once, uh, uh, I, I used to, I, for a while I was selling boats when I was back in Long Island. And there was someone who, I didn't even realize it went that low. There was someone who came in and, and Joseph, this guy had a, 375 credit score. Ex insane, right? And um, now, 
what is the one thing uh, 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 I'll take this off for a minute. What is the one thing that you think jams a lot of people up on their credit score that they have no idea? Anybody got a guess? Well, I know there can when be. When they close it down. That's good. Student loans. Late payments. Student loans, uh-huh. Well, uh, student loans you know about, but these are ones where it's a surprise. When you when you close, like you pay a credit card off and you close it. Okay, uh-huh, that's one of them. But here's the top of the list, it's very surprising. Medical co-payments. Unpaid medical co-payments, those $20. And would, uh, would you believe when I was managing my, my, my mother's account, there was something where uh, we didn't make a uh, a twenty dollar copay. It was um, UCLA Medical. It went to collection. I got a collection notice for twenty dollars, and then there was another one for that was ten dollars, and they sent it to collection. And I called the company. I said, "Are you kidding me? You sent <laughs> you sent this to collection?" <laughs> Uh, so what were you expecting? But that was a surprising thing that showed up on a lot of people's uh, um, uh, credit score was uh, unpaid, um, unpaid credit, uh, unpaid um, co-pays. All right, let's get back to business here. Screen share. And, and that's one of the reasons, Greg, you, uh, I use a system um, called uh, uh, Rocket Money. Because anything that happens that gets re, uh, charged to you or requested, it usually pops up on there, especially those reoccurring things that you may have forgotten about mm -hmm. and uh, being able to stay on top of your money. So it's sending you notifications because sometimes your banks do, do do that. Sometimes they don't do that. But yeah, staying on top and and having your uh, the apps for your medical companies um, mm -hmm. on your phone because and and selecting the notifications so that they'll let you know that you have those issues. And for those of us that are on Medicare, you got to be real careful because they don't really send out letters and notifications and all kinds of crazy things can be happening. And unless you go to their website on a regular basis, you may have not gotten your payment notice and they'll cancel your your Medicare uh, for non-payment, and then they'll charge you a lifetime penalty for um, for not having it, and then they don't let you get back in until the next year. So that that lifetime uh, ten percent of twenty dollars, whatever it is, it adds up and it increases your Medicare. For those of us that are on that, be very very careful. I say check into your Medicare thing because that too can mess up your credit. <laughs> So uh, while I was running the PowerPoint, I'm unable to see the chat. So um, I'm sort of taking a time out here to see if there was any questions. I'm scanning through it right now. Uh, IRS wants to report illegal money. To, yeah. Oh, so uh, I'll get to that in a moment. Can I see anything here? Chelsea, you said I didn't know that was possible. What was that? Uh, the 375. Oh, so 375 credit score. <laughs> yeah. Gregory, I have well, a question, but I can't put it in the chat. This is Tia. Hello, Tia. How are you? Good, good. Good to see you. I just want to clear something up. Um, if you're married in a, uh, your, your spouse passes away um, and they had some credit card bills pending that they were paying, um, is, shouldn't you pay them off? Um, even if you guys don't have them joint or anything like that, someone told me, oh, you don't need to pay them off. But I did. But I, so what is the truth about that? So my understanding is that spouses inherit uh, the uh, the debt. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, if there was some pre-existing debt that's only in the name, uh, sometimes you can lobby to say, I didn't know about that, maybe uh, trying to ask for quote unquote, some forgiveness, but essentially, um, yeah, spouses do inherit uh, inherit debt. That's what I thought. It wasn't any large amounts, but I was like, I, you know, I, I thought you were supposed to do that. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That may be a state by state issue, but California, and I think everyone here lives in California, this is a community mm -hmm. property state. 
That mm-hmm. also means community debt state. So unless you can prove that those debts were incurred prior to the marriage, mm-hmm. you shouldn't be responsible for them. Typically, you will be. Yeah. Because you're yeah. part of that person's estate, which you are now fully inheriting. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. There, there have been some cases where the, uh, the spouse, um, uh, there was some debt previously known or it was business related debt or something and they uh, had no knowledge of it. Um, it does give you, usually you work with an attorney and it usually gives you some basis to try to, you know, uh, settle. Um, and um, now if it's a husband and wife business, that's probably <laughs> not, not uh, uh, it's not gonna work, but um, it, uh, there, there are some things. And Joseph is right, it, it is a, um, uh, an issue. Um, and there is that demarcation, I think, here in, in the state of California, certainly when settlements, uh, we are, when you are married at uh, more, 10 years or more. So that, that um, uh, cements it even further that if you've been married less than 10 years, um, the, um, the settlement on, on assets um, is, can be sort of negotiated, but when you're 10 years and and over um so and i, I remember seeing a study somewhere of that of the number of divorces or filing for divorces right at that nine-year mark <laughs> it's like okay <laughs> i've been thinking about this let me let me make this uh let me make this happen before we get to uh before we get to year 10. all right let me scan through this a little bit because this is some other things uh, it talks about insurance All right, now I did um, have this one to share. This was something that I started working on. Let's go here and share. So this is this is the conundrum of people in business, all right? So you've got people who are great with managing money and using software. And uh, the, the place you don't want to be is in this red box where you're terrible at managing money, both personally and in business. Ideally, you want to be in this green box. You want to be great with your, uh, your business money and your personal. I am finding um, many uh, are good with their, they're in, they're in here. They're great with business but they're terrible at managing their, um, uh, their, their, their personal stuff. Um, and that happens very often. They're not focused on it or they're doing business planning, forgetting about estate planning, forgetting about um, uh, succession, you know, what happens with the business. Uh, so that, that is a, uh, that's a big issue, um, especially in family businesses. And there are some instances where uh, I think it's about two thirds of the time, the children, uh, the second generation will take over a business, but when you get to the third generation, it drops down to single digit money. So, uh, your children may step in, you know, father and son and father and son businesses. Um, but when it comes down to the third generation, they have no interest. And that was the past. Now we're finding that a lot of, um, uh, in fact, I was I was talking with someone who's a business owner. Uh, his dad was in business. He's now in business. His kids have absolutely no interest at all in managing the business. That was a good friend of mine who uh, owned a uh, uh, a real money making bakery. I mean, he was he was really doing very very well. He was selling about fifteen hundred cakes a week. Fifteen hundred. All right, large bakery, and uh, he built the business up. And his three adult children, they all went to, you know, good schools. Uh, none of them had any interest in working in the business and managing. So he ended up, um, he got to retirement age and uh, he sold, actually, he, he, he sold the business, but they the developer is more interested in the land than the business itself. So um, he sold it for an incredible amount of money. And... Um, and went and then just went on there. 
So uh, at this stage, I'm going to open up for questions. Uh, anybody have sort of a financial literacy question? I, I went through sort of my base uh, uh, base level course that I use for financial literacy, uh, but I'd like to uh, take some questions. Yes, Stephen. Um, part of one one of the components of financial literacy is saving. What is your recommend, recommendation for the greatest or recommended saving mechanism? What platform? Stocks, bonds, real estate. How should we put our savings? What instrument? Great question. Great question. So, um, and, and I look at uh, three types of savings. All right. I always categorize with my clients three types. You got a short term, mid term, and long term savings. Short term savings is money that you would expect to use in less than five years. Mid term is going to be somewhere between five to five years to retirement age, all right? And then long-term savings are, are funds that you're going to be putting away for your quote unquote golden years uh, into retirement so that you are going down three different paths. Um, and so the strategies for each of them are gonna be different. With your short-term savings, you know, recommend really just a savings account or you can use CDs or money markets so it's liquid. You've got no uh, uh, penalties uh, to do that. And um, ideally you wanna have, uh, well, at a minimum, you wanna have a month's worth of covering your bills and expenses. So your mortgage, all, everything that you have to pay to have a month's worth. Uh, I believe that an ideal position to be is to have six months of your net pay or uh, you know net pay that you have. And then I and I believe that once you get to 12 months, you've got a year's worth where you didn't have to worry about paying any bill at all for 12 months, you stop there. Then you that start moving into different platforms, whether you're investing money. Um, I, sh I didn't mute this phone. This is a separate line that very few people call me on. And anyway. Um, that you have them invested in, um, you can do CDs, uh, CD rates have gotten a lot better, annuities now, um, you've got long-term and mid-term and short-term annuities, there's annuities that have anywhere from uh, three to seven year terms, and those rates are very good. Um, and then your long-term savings can be obviously in investments, uh, uh, direct, so you can have um, a um, uh, Schwab account or E-Trade, what have you, or work with a, a broker uh, that can be in um, stocks, bonds, mutual funds. Um, we we also recommend that you your amount of risk is tailored to your age. If you are in your twenties slash thirties, you can be a lot more risky uh about it um because you've got time to recover if you are within 10 15 years I mean, yeah within 10 15 years of retiring you want to balance it out a little bit and then if you are five years or less from retiring then you want to be very strategic and you want to have more of your money in safer products um, there used to be a strategy between stocks and bonds, and I'm not an investment provider, so I can't give specific advice. Uh, my license doesn't allow me to provide specific investment advice, but um, the old adage of that stock and bond mixture has changed because things have changed. Um, we have been expecting a market downturn for years now, uh, and there are uh, rumors that um, after post-election, no matter who wins, that we sh could see a pretty sharp uh, decline in, in values. Uh, the last report that I saw is that it could be as deep as 44%. So a 44% in, uh, in, in equity loss uh, after the election. So, um, you know, there, there's a lot of safe options and then there's a lot of options out there uh, to uh, to happen. Oh, so here's the other thing I meant to mention. Uh, somebody have a question on that? All right. Here's an area on taxation. Remember, I was talking about taxation. So the IRS is uh, my nickname is uh, I call her Iris. 
is uh, going to be getting very aggressive with digital currency, digital assets. You'll notice now in the 1040, uh, the, they're asking the question, yes or no? Did you sell anything? Did you have any gains on digital assets, which is Bitcoin and all the other ones out there? Eventually, uh, and, and the IRS right now is going through a uh, process of hiring agents. And I've heard that they were bringing a minimum of 2,500 agents just in the audit group. Uh, so over the coming years, uh, the revenue service is going to be more aggressive in auditing. And one of the areas they're going to go after is, are you uh, declaring, are you uh, uh, putting down any gains on these digital assets? And if you check that box, no, <laughs> and, you, and now these subsequently find out that you did, now they've got you even harder because you claim, you said no. If you click check the box, yes, you still don't have to put anything in there. But that's sort of getting you off the hook. So you want to get tax advice, you know, from a tax practitioner on that. But that is uh, that is an area that is uh, that is coming. Uh, I think Crystal's there. So uh, does that answer your question? Does anybody have have a question here? What's the story behind the Visa MasterCard? So that's a good question, Stephen. I don't know. Um, on the uh, the five point five billion dollar settlement, uh, I have not heard that, not read up on that yet. So that is uh, that is something to research. Three ways to keep your distance: contactless payments. And then, Roz, what do you got here? I have to close my business because it's not. Yeah. Okay. I think she's asking you for suggestions on that. Um, I do know from when you close your business, uh, you have to make sure if you've been doing your self-employment taxes that you don't, just because your business didn't make money doesn't mean that they don't want their money. They do. That $800 has to be paid whether you, whether you are um, in business, out of business, no money. Uh, once you set that up, you have to pay that $800. And then if you're closing out that particular business, once you've cleared out that debt, you can dissolve that company. So it's just not a matter of you saying, I shut the business down. You have to actually go through the processes of shutting it down with the state of California um, so that they know that you set it down. Because if not, they will continually to charge you that $800. That's exactly it. Okay. <laughs> So, and don't get caught up in that because that too will mess up your credit, your business credit. And uh, so that's really, really important. Well, actually, what 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 what's going to happen to the other debt that you owe on um, for, with creditors? With your creditors? Yeah. You need it's not to... the 800, I'm not talking about the $800. I'm talking about other, other debt that you owe with other um, creditors. Well, if the if you incurred those expenses during the time your business was open, and Joseph and Greg can can confirm this, um, you still are liable because that was made under the auspices that was under the uh, the business being open. So you still are responsible, unless of course you're going to file bankruptcy. Uh, Joseph, you uh, Greg, you want to uh, jump in on that one? But but if the if the business is if the expenses occurred while you were in business, uh, then and and during that the, the time frame between when you're in business when you close your business, and then of course you need to notify all of your business your debt your vendors that you are closing the business so that they know. And this is the dissolution or the dissolving of that business, but you still are required to pay those debts. What was the structure of the business? Was it a sole proprietorship, a corporation, an LLC? The LLC. Okay. The LLC is responsible for those debts. The LLC, even though it's closed, is still an entity that lives on forever. If you are the responsible for the person for that LLC, those debts will follow you as well. Um, you may be able to make some 
uh, negotiations and some accommodations to pay the debt off at a lesser amount because more, more than likely the people you owe are seeking to collect and they may be willing to take um, a reduced amount versus what you owe. Um, mm -hmm. I had put a note in the chat that if you want to have an offline session about that, you can click on my calendar. But yeah, you, you can't walk away from a business and wash your hands of the debt and say, okay, I'm clear now. It's still following you. And, yeah, I, and I Joseph, think had, Joseph has a little bit more leeway to, to chat about it. My, uh, my specific license prevents me from uh, giving anyone uh, tax or uh, legal advice, even though I may know. Uh, I certainly can't do it publicly. Um, so if my hands are uh, more tied in terms of uh, ta tax or um, tax or legal advice. And, and uh, uh, Joseph can also, you are, you are the person behind the business. So Joseph, can you uh, talk to the point that you are the responsible body uh, to all your business, even though you are, you you have your legal structures, but ultimately, and that also goes with your um, credit ratings and uh, um, applying for business credit. The gut Joseph is excellent at that stuff. Well, absolutely. If you've defaulted on previous business loans, getting new business credit is a non-starter until you've cleared that up. I tell people all the time, people all often come and ask about credit repair and how can I clean up my credit? And really the only way is to pay. Now you may not have to pay everything that you owe, but you're gonna to have to pay some of what you owe. Even bankruptcy doesn't, doesn't clear you of that. It just gives you a, a time frame when you'll be free of it, but it's either seven or 10 years, depending upon the type of bankruptcy that you file. I also never, or oh, rarely, I should say, never is too big a word. I rarely advise people to file bankruptcy. But again, that gets into a lot of detail. I'm trying to be more broad because I don't know all of the ins and outs of what your situation and circumstance are, what type of debt it is, who you owe. A lot of things come into play when you're talking about getting clear of, of past debt. I hope that answered your question. Um, I actually put some other things in. I've heard, and, and this is from people that I do know, you guys need to be really, really careful with your third party uh, con uh, um, apps, the Zales, the Cash apps, and so forth. Um, there's some information there that you can be, you can, you can um, take heed and take tips from. Uh, I do know some clients that, um, lost $18,000 sending Zelle uh, through, which is ridiculous anyway, because if you're in business, you should really be using your accounting software or merchant service that is uh, regulated by the FDIC um, and that you have, uh, you can then go back to them to get your monies back um, and get them to refund your monies. There are a number of banks right now, I'm not quite sure what's going on in the banking world, but I get notifications on a regular basis that banks are not necessarily refunding your money back to you. So again, I think if you have a relationship with your bank, then that's a better move because they know you, they know your actions and you can have a conversation. You can call somebody directly to have that conversation, but you really should be really think about it. And I know Zelle is easy. Uh, those 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 platforms are very easy to use and convenient, but they're also very easy to use for for scammers. So be very very careful of that. There's a big scam going on right now that they're using AI uh, to call you to say that a relative is need in need of a money, and it sounds like your relative, mom, dad, send me money, and then you send it through them on, and it's something through Spectrum. I just read that the other day, and they're cloning your your car, and then they're going in and wiping out your money. That was something that I got on Monday. Uh, so be very careful. Uh, it seems like the 50 plus crowd is the age, the age that scammers are like on you. And so they're calling you on the phone, asking for your information. Don't give anybody your information. I don't care who I wouldn't give to my grandmother. <laughs> Call them back. If they're calling you, I ain't volunteering. No information. Why are you calling me? Yes, Joseph. <laughs> well, now you triggered the old banker in me. So, yeah. so let me, let me, 
offer some tips on this area. Okay. One of them, I kind of like Greg's debit card idea, but one of the things that we always counsel people to do, if you have a debit card that's attached to your checking account, never use it as a debit card. Always use it as a credit card because there are different protections when you use it as a credit card. People will say, well, it's a debit card. Put your pin in. No, 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 no. If it has a Visa or MasterCard logo, let them charge it as that. They want you to use it as a debit card because it's cheaper for them. But then you have now forfeited your protections. And if that card is somehow cloned, they have complete access to whatever's in your checking account. If you've used it as a credit card, you have protections and, and some of that money can come back to you more quickly. The second thing is, Crystal's right. Anytime anyone calls you, and, and now they're doing it by text too, so you have to really be careful. They'll, they'll send you a text that's supposedly from your bank and they'll have a link there. They want you to verify a charge or do something, this, that, and the other. We need to talk to you. Please click this link. First of all, sometimes I get them from banks I don't have accounts in, so I know it's a scam. But if it does come from, let's say you bank at Bank of America and it looks like it came from Bank of America, go online or call Bank of America yourself and ask them, you know, are you trying to verify a charge? Um, you know, what kind of information do you need? Never respond to the phone number that's in the text or the email and never respond to the phone call that you get by providing them any personal information. Almost every time you log into your online accounts, there'll be a banner at the top. I've noticed it for quite a while now on all of mine that says, we will never ask you for personal information over the phone. They already have all your personal information. They shouldn't have to ask you for anything other than verifying your identification. But do that when you call them. That way you know you're talking to Bank of America, or Wells Fargo, or whoever it might be, not some scammer who's trying to uh, rush you and get, you, get your information. And if they say it's urgent, slow down. It's not that urgent. Nothing scammers have gotten there. very creative. Uh, hackers have gotten very creative. <clears throat> um, another one that's out there is that uh, they call and they say, can you hear me? And I say, no, I can't hear you. Very Why? Good. Okay. Because they are looking to record you saying yes. Once you say yes, they can stitch that into, do you agree to these terms? Boom, mm -hmm. they insert your yes. And now they've got your voice agreeing to it. So can you hear me? I tell them, no, I, don't, I can't hear you at all. All right. Sometimes it's a live person, but oftentimes it is just a, a bot. And it continues on. So I, I just tell you, I can't hear you. <laughs> so um, I, that's a good point because see credit cards, the charge goes through a, uh, a, a sort of a clearinghouse, a credit card clearinghouse. And then you're able to dispute a charge far more easily with a credit card than you are with a debit card. If you use your debit card, that money comes out of your account instantly. And that, and that, you know, just, um, I, I may differ a little bit with Joseph because even though you use that credit option, the money still comes out of your account. It's gone. All right. With a credit card, you're in the, the sitting with the with the clearinghouse. Now, the, if you dispute it, especially if you dispute it within a certain amount of time, that merchant has to prove that it was a legitimate charge. And if right. the merchant is unable to do that, then you're off the hook with a debit card, whether you pick debit or credit. All right. That money's out of your account instantly. Once it's out of your account, your leverage is gone because now you've got to fight with the bank and uh, the merchant, but the merchant already has your money. I was where, talking more about using your debit card in a situation where it gets compromised. Yeah. If you're actually using your debit card to make a purchase on the spot, that isn't a problem because you know you did that. I'm talking about that number now being used for other charges that you didn't authorize. True, true. But what I'm saying is that rather than use the debit card, using the, the credit card or a, a lot of things, if I'm uncertain, because they've been pretty, pretty good with uh, protection is I'll use American Express. Um, and I will use American Express for online purchases because uh, American Express, in my opinion, has been excellent 
in uh, in re resolving disputes. And I am hey, actually this month. Yeah, I'm now um, uh, the card number I've had now for 41 years. I guess I'm giving my, my way my age. Here. But uh, I've had this account for 41 years. So when they see that 41 year member, um, you know, they they look to take care of their uh, members. So I use I use Amex uh, more often then I might would certainly use a, uh, a debit card. Debit card is just point of sale. You know, if I'm buying groceries or things like that at a known place, um, I don't use it at all at 7-Elevens. I don't use it in parking meters or, or any of those. I, I use that, what I call it, that disposable uh, debit card. And um, every month, whatever it drops down to, I just load it up and bring it back up to uh, $100 and then spend down from that. And every, and also, uh, if you're doing that on, uh, at, if you're ordering, especially companies you don't know on on online, is a good thing. And also, be very careful with your subscriptions. I just had a battle with a company that I was not using. Um, the trial I canceled, but they went on and debited my card anyway. And then they come back, and after you, it's like, wait, no, I canceled that. And they're like, oh yeah, but we don't do refunds, so now you have the service. And so went, no. And that's not how that's going to work. And so I went back and saw that they also had, a, um, there was a bait and switch there. So then I came back with my uh, copy of the bait and switch in the state of California and that I was reporting them to the B the Better Business, Music, a bit Better Business Bureau. And all of a sudden they jumped right back and, okay, no, no, we'll send you your money. So no, okay. don't. And so be very careful of the subscriptions that you're setting up for. And also uh, there's a couple of them on that, on the Ancestry. You know, they'll copy the information from Ancestry.com and then set you up an account. The next thing you know, you're paying an annual fee for that one. So the scammers are really, really busy out there is basically what I'm saying. And so you guys just be very comp, uh, cautious um, with your accounts. I, I always say know who is at your bank, know your bankers because they know your habits. And when you call in, then you're not going to get a lot of pushback. But don't just be a bank account number in the system. Just know who it is so that you can call them and have those discussions. Um, it's funny, I was hosting a, uh, a breakfast meeting and I went into Starbucks and I was buying um, five gallons of coffee, right? So it was at that time, it was 90 bucks. And Mercury Express rejected the sale. And they rejected the sale because it was out of the the, the spending pattern. Because who spends ninety dollars in Starbucks, right? Yeah. So um, I don't uh, I don't have a banking app on my phone. I do not use banking on my phone. I only do my banking from my desktop computer. Um, I, I have never ever deposited a check into an a machine ATM machine. I don't Just, do that. I do do banking to deposit my check, but my bank, City First Bank, boy, they ain't no joke. Half time, they only let me do stuff that I want to do. I have to. They go, did you do this? Yeah, I did that. I get com I get communication from them like every five minutes. Did you do this? What is this? Why did you do this? And then you go in and you try. You miss your password two times. You can't get in. You got to call them. You got to go into. So it's frustrating, but at least my money's safe, Stephen. <laughs> A great presentation, Gregory. Uh, open the door. And you're a great street, uh, street man. And June, on the 14th, we're going to have Troy Shockley, who worked for American Express, as our guest. But not to get too far ahead, next week, um, our special guest is Ryan Wilson, the owner of The Gathering Spot. He's going to talk about membership, clubs, and exclusivity next week on the Community Briefing, next Thursday, 11 o'clock. Cool. Awesome. And uh, be sure to put your debit card and expiration number and PIN in the chat so uh, we can <laughs> share that with our members. <laughs> Let's see if you guys are listening to the top of this about being careful of scams. Yeah. <laughs> the funny thing is, all the things great do, the I team. do all the time. I deposited a check with my phone just yesterday. I, well, I have a I have a tablet no. that doesn't have it. Um, it doesn't have um, any uh, uh, cellular on it, and it doesn't go anywhere. 
So I will use that. I have been using that to deposit checks. So I do have it on there, but I won't put it on my phone. There's no way that I'm taking it out. And that, and that it's an old tablet. It's probably, I don't know, eight, nine years old, still works. And no, I, no uh, operation, no updates. <laughs> do you, do you use a VPN? A VPN? No. Okay. Yeah. No, I thought about it, but I, I, I did before and I, I was running into issues with certain sites. So um but i um uh, i yeah, do it's hard to get in those adult sites with a vpn ah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey greg i have a I, I, I have so i've in. heard i have never tried yeah, it myself yeah, yeah, but that's yeah. what i've heard oh gosh i haven't done that bianca in three had, years uh, bianca had a comment yeah you know yeah. um i mentor a lot of small businesses and it, you know when greg says put your credit card number you know on the line I, a lot of small businesses and on their capability statement and on their website, they put their EIN number. And I try to tell them, it's like putting your social security on your, you know, out to open for everyone. You know, the, the, those are the other things that business owners, we have to protect our EIN number just as much as we protect our social security number. Yeah, because it's the business's ID number. So you want to be very careful. And I think sometimes in business, you know, I, you know, I, we all are coaching them, right? So I just, some of the things that are just common sense that, yeah, anything to do with your money, don't let everybody know about it. That's all I say. <laughs> yeah, some, somebody bought a boat from Canada, use my EIN number to, because they didn't want to pay the taxes to, um, to bring the boat over. And IRS called me and they said, I owe like $46,000 for the boat. And I was like, I didn't buy a boat. They literally came to my office for eight hours and audit every piece of documents for a year and a half to assure that I was not, that it was a, some, it was fraudulent that I didn't buy that book. I mean, that boat. And it was very stressful, you know, but the people yeah. can, um, just like they can use your social security card, they can use your EIN number too. Oh, real quick. That, that's a good point. Real quick. You do want to set up alerts in your banking system for certain types of transactions, uh, you can even set up uh, thresholds. So anything over, uh, I have mindset where uh, anything over hundred dollars, any transaction over hundred dollars, I'm getting I'm getting a text. So um, any uh, anything that's out of the ordinary, yeah, out um, of the country, my my bank uh, flags anything that comes out of the country. Um, yeah, that yeah. They, So they always reach out to issue. And if it's something, I and I think also if they are flagged by other, uh, uh, somebody else has flagged that, it also will be popular. You know that will be a problem. Um, and again, at my bank, uh, they are they 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 veer to the super conservative, <laughs> and so they are mo they monitor everything. Yeah, um, which is good though because if something happens they'll reach out to me or I'll reach out to them and they're well aware of it already. And, and so getting a refund is not a challenge, but I, but I am reading lately that some of the bigger banks, the Chase's, the Wells Fargo's, um, the B of A's, uh, there are people having accounts shut down for because some scammer has done something and then you can't get to any of your money. So you really, you really need to be careful about that guy. So, um, Again, it's about that relationship, I think. But yes, relationship, being being careful, uh, setting up alerts and notifications. Uh, I've, I've got low balance alerts. I've got a high balance alert. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's, you just you just want to set set all that up on your business and your uh, your, your personal accounts to uh, the safeguard. It's it's getting rougher out here. Um, it's, um, uh, you know, and a lot of these uh, uh, hackers are out of the country. Um, so, you know, there is no, there's no follow up. They're using um, roaming IP addresses. So uh, it's not a static IP. Um, so you, they, they can't even be tracked. Yeah. So just word to the wise. And if you're in business, you definitely should be have you should have an accounting system so that you can track all that and reconcile and review every transaction and reconcile at the end of the month, create your financial reports. That's the only way you can stay on top of that. And just as Bianca says, identity theft is just not identified to individuals, yeah. but it's also to it businesses. Is. And mm -hmm. I'm gonna tell you, as if you've ever had identity theft, 
you got to prove who you are, not who they not. <laughs> you got to <laughs> prove who you are. And it, and it can be very challenging uh, on your part, just like the access. Don't like, you don't want the IRS asking you questions and you don't want to have to identify and, and to verify who you are as a human being that had, you know, somebody else is taking your information. Yes, Renee. And then just, my, uh, yes. My son had, had a credit card and he closed the account. I think it was with Amazon uh, because he couldn't resolve this payment that, that they were trying to get. He closed it and opened a new account and they got his new account number and billed him on that. Yeah, yeah, there's a so oh, he's again, still trying to resolve yeah, that. I would, I, yeah, I would that's that's one of the issues. I would, I would personally, I would never want an Amazon credit account. I don't want a credit account with a merchant. <laughs> I, my credit, my credit or debit account is only going to be with a, a bank. Um, and I think that can it, it, it can lead to uh, the problems because you don't know what they're, I don't know if there's how what they're bound to, but. And then you're I don't bound think it's to a their, credit your, account. I think actually the Amazon credit account is a credit card. What'd you say? So it works the same as every other credit card. It's a credit card. Except you can only use it at Amazon. Think of it as a oh, no, store he credit card. Have that. But he who's the financial it. institution? Um, uh, I'd I mean, have to look. There is actually a bank behind it. I think it's yeah, yeah, you know, I think it's synchrony or something. <laughs> no, it's it's Synchrony Bank. Now that I think about it, who and Synchrony Bank. Ooh. Well, <laughs> if, you, if you know, you know, they are a real bank. Okay. They back, they back a lot of department store cards. They back, they back um, most pe most of the gas companies that offer credit cards, they back them too. And they're, they're governed by the same rules as any um, credit card would be. So you can yeah, dispute but... charges. Um, all the rest of those things. I've done that, so I know that it works. And goes through your, uh, the fair out uh, marketing. Renee, what was you, you saying? It wasn't. Oh, at, he doesn't have a credit card with Amazon, but he has Amazon Prime, and then he buys things on Amazon. Oh, and okay. The one thing that he didn't do was um, buy what they said. And, he, and when he got out, they found his next card and billed him again. So, well, of course, your you know your social security number is the tracker, right? So if he had to use that on anything, uh, though I don't remember having to do that on Amazon Prime, so yeah, you definitely you have to go into it. But throw that BBB around sometimes, and then go in and find what your rights are as a as a creditor T, and um, and and new companies will back off. Uh, but we're gonna it's twelve it's twelve ten. Thank you guys so Bye. much. Lee <laughs> says that May is Small Business Month, and uh, there's some information she popped in the chat for the National Small Business Week um, from the SBA. So pull that down. You guys can make a copy of the of the um what do you call it the chat here and i will try to pull some of the information and put it in to the video because there was some valuable stuff really guys basically financial literacy is financial competency but knowing and understanding how your money works and uh risk management on that money that you have is so important teach your children <laughs> just don't walk through life just thinking that money is operating on its own it is not. We work hard for it. So protect it, guys. <laughs> All righty. So thank you, guys. So next week we have the guy um, Brian. Uh, fr from Brian from uh, Brian, the gathering. Brian, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, Ryan. Gathering spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gathering spot. So Ryan, Ryan, sorry. Uh, so you want to check us out and please share. Um, and we will see you guys next week. Also, Lee says April 30th and May 1st we'll have a uh, 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 the SBA will have a series of national webinars. So check that out. May 1st is my birthday. I will not be doing business on, I will be not looking at websites and webinars <laughs> on May 1st. <laughs> All righty. So Emma says Prime is an uh, Amazon car, credit card backed by Chase. Thank you, Emma. <laughs> and his thing is with Chase, his account. So yeah. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Greg, okay. great job. Thank you. All right, you guys. us a lot of little things. And <laughs> things that we overlook, huh, Renee? Exactly. <laughs> and and if, you didn't, that... if you didn't put your credit card number in the chat, you can email it to us, and uh, we'll be glad to. <laughs> <laughs>